So hey there, everybody. Welcome to The Hard Truth Inside the Football Industry Podcast with me, Philip Heidson, and Dara McAnthony, El Presidente. And I think you now have the car parking space to prove it. You got it, baby. You got it. <laughs> um, and the co-owner of Peterborough United. Okay. Today, we're going to be catching up with Dara on the weekend's action. Some, we'll talk about stadium protocols. Uh, we have some listener questions. And then we're going to go into a special fans forum. We're going to preview the new season with fans from across the divisions. Awesome. Um, so let's start. And I guess I got to send my commiserations uh, on, uh, <laughs> on Saturday. Uh, when you said that, makes me think Bradford won their game. <laughs> maybe we did. You know, I can spend the next hour talking about that if you like. <laughs> did you Did you get to tune in? Did you watch it? You yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, we had a load yeah. of eye follow issues on our end. And like my, my co-owners, had v, have, we have VIP accounts. Mm-hmm. And they couldn't get it turned on. And guess what? The EFL forgot to turn on the VIP account link for the game. And it's like, really, guys? We're not allowed fans back in. And now we're getting, I mean, fucking really? Like, yeah. seriously, we've had months to prep for this and make sure things are working. What on earth? I wish I could say I was surprised. Ugh. You know, our, our sound feed sounded as though it was being recorded from a bathroom somewhere. But at least we had, you know, I, I, we've talked about this before. I'm like, I'm really grateful for iFollow because what's the alternative? No, you know, no, uh, no. but they don't help themselves sometimes. They don't. And it's like, you got to get this right. If you're going to start yeah. from having fans in, and this mm-hmm. is the only outlet for fans for the moment, it's got to be bang on. And yeah. it has to be invested in. Um, so really, really, that was frustrating. Well, mm-hmm. the, the result. I mean, I have to say, I probably, if you said to me five months ago, are you looking forward to getting trolled when you lose a game of football? I'd have said, you need the troll. Because <laughs> without football, I was begging for football. Yeah. And that first bit of trolling I got on Saturday, you know, I opened up and I can't remember who was it. It was a fan of another club straight away on my Twitter feed, enjoying the fact we lost a game of football. I was kind of like, welcome back. Motherfucker, mm-hmm. <laughs> it, like, it didn't bother me because I'm the just, first oh, step to normalcy. Yeah, it was. It was. It was like, oh, God, the trolling's back. Great, everything's kind of way, you know, normal in the world again. Um, yeah, the football was shit. Um, fair play to Cheltenham, they were really well organized. Um, mm-hmm. you know, deserve to win. We had chances, they had chances, but we were we were at a five out of ten. So, you know, where that came from, I've no idea. That's football. Um, it was eerie, the atmosphere, but you can't blame empty stadiums. Everyone's playing the same game. Um, we just didn't show up to the races, unfortunately. So I'm hoping that's a kick in the arse for the players. Because mm-hmm. we did. Um, you know, a la next, well, we've got a cup game tomorrow night, but the league starts on Saturday. So if we go like that to Akron and Stanley with that kind of attitude, we, we'll lose. Yeah. You know, that's football. Yeah. Well, I guess get it out of the way early. Yeah. Get it out of the way early. You know what? I never know. You talk about, is it how you start? Is it how you finish? Last year, I would have said, it's not how you start. It's how you finish. But fuck, mm-hmm. we never finish. So it's kind of like, now you're going, is it how you start? You know, if they want to shut everything down again. So I don't know. You got you you, you roll with the punches. But um, it is what it is. I was just happy to see our team playing football again. Yeah. Um, the results will follow. The performances will follow. Um, I didn't drive away angry, maybe irritated. Mm-hmm. But that's always the feeling when your team loses. Um, you know, we do shit in this cup for some reason. We've lost yeah. a year in the first round. Um, so yeah, on to the next uh, battle and uh, hopefully watch winning football sooner rather than later. <laughs> yeah, well, silver linings, you know, you don't have in a season where we're going to be playing midweek and at the weekends, um, you know, a lot of weeks, it's a few less games in the calendar. I love football. I, I'd have games every two days if we could. Right. But every sport. You players may grumble about that. No, nah, no, nah, the sports scientists would more than anything. They, they, those fuckers rule the game nowadays. Fair play to them. You know, they're very professional, but they kind of mm-hmm. tell your manager how many minutes they can play, how many minutes that new signing can play. And, you know, we've got like a million pound plus striker in the bench at the moment because obviously he's got to get his minutes and get fit. Yeah. Poor scientists all over that. And you got to listen to these guys, I suppose, to the experts. Otherwise, you get inj- injured players. But uh, mm. for me, I play it for 48 hours. Yeah, I love football that much. So gutted to lose in the cup. Well, you know, my my Saturday was slightly different experience. Wanker. You know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> having having gone in expecting us to get tanked five nil, you know, and you know, thinking that we hadn't recruited well enough and we've got gaps everywhere, and we still do. Um, but it was a we did well against Bolton and um, pulled a two one win out of the bag, and it was so, surprising as it was a good result. So you're optimistic um, now after watching that. 
Well, a little bit more. You know, you never know. And I think this this season more than ever, you don't really know the quality of the opposition. Sure. Um, you know, because people haven't been playing preseason, everything's been behind closed doors. I think we're still, we've talked about before the fact that so many thin, you know, like threadbare squads at the moment because yeah. there's a lot of players still to come to build up those squads. 100%. I really hadn't, I had no idea what to expect. And you see Bolton, you know, off to the races with all the signings that they made and um, new manager and everything. Sure. I wasn't overly confident. Thanks, Tom. We haven't, we haven't won away from home in 11 months. Okay. So, uh, and like you, we've not had the best run since we actually got to the final. Yeah. We've been knocked out in the first round, I think, the last six or seven years. Right. Gotcha. So, um, oh, yeah, it, it helped for confidence. But, yeah. you know, next Saturday, we'll lose first day of the season. You know, we'll, we'll oh. come back down to uh, all of them, aren't square you? one again. You lose and then you win and you're riding a white horse into the office on a Monday. Swamping <laughs> the place like you're the Lord. I get it. You know what I mean? Look, um, it's funny. We said, like, what did we talk about a couple of weeks ago? We spoke about all these players who haven't got clubs and yeah. some good players. And and I said to you at the time, what would happen as the weeks go by and the inch closer and closer to October and the close of the window? What would happen to the demands of those players? What did I say? Mm-hmm. They're going to, I mean, they're going to be fighting for a club. So their wage demands are going to go well down. So we had, a, we had a, one of the players on our list early in the summer um, we went after. And the player's agent was very much, nah, fuck off. We want championship football. Mm-hmm. And all, all today, um, and before posh fans start going on, Schmodix, Schmodix, this isn't Sammy Schmodix, this is a completely different player. Um, the agent rang us today for that player and said, look, my player's got such and such offer for X a pound per week. And we said, mm-hmm. for a championship. No, 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 he's, he'll do a year in League One, but he'll only sign a one-year deal. So we're like, all right, okay, the penny's dropping now, the panic's yeah. there, the league starts next week. And this is what I've been saying. I've been saying it to agents, I've been saying it to players. You have to come to a new realization. We are in a different world at the moment. Yeah, it's, I can't remember the manager that I read was saying it, but you know, he said there's going to be a few players where you look and say, "Wow, he he took that deal. He ended up there." Correct. Where, you know, you may not expect those players to end up in those clubs, but you know, they're going to start getting desperate. Correct, absolutely. Because, and this is where I feel for the players a little bit, and I do. Because I, I am a player's chairman. Do you know what I mean? I, go, I get on well with football players and still do today. The players are all coaches and managers. Yeah. Um, a lot of players take their advice of the agent verbatim. They'll do whatever the agent says. So if the agent says to you, look, Phil, play it cool, sit at home, relax with the missus, I'm going to get you that move. Mm. Go by and you're on the phone. And he's saying, Phil, you got to trust me. you got to trust me. I'm going to get you that six grand a week. I'm going to get you your move. And you're sitting there with your family. And then all of a sudden, a week to go, and the season's starting, everyone's forgotten about Phil. And the agent's bringing you, going, look, Phil, I've got you 1,500 quid a week, um, blah, blah, blah. And, and you know what? Sometimes you have to put your own destiny and fate in your own hands and be decisive. And yeah. don't let somebody else determine your future. Don't let them play such a large part. Yes, they're there to advise you. Yes, they're there to negotiate a good deal. But don't let that be the, be, them be the be-all and end-all. Be a man, be a woman, make the decision yourself when you need to. Do you know what I mean? Well, the problem that some of them have, well, a lot of players that are um, don't have contracts yet have is that they haven't had that preseason now as well. So you're coming to a club and you've got, you know, how many weeks of fitness work. So your value is diminished even further because you're not going to be able to use you for another month, let's say. 100%. And I said, and I said this today because obviously we've had a couple of those players join late and they are behind. And it's going to take probably another three weeks before they're fully up to speed. And we're mm-hmm. three weeks into the season then. And the player the agent rang about today, he hasn't trained since March, April practically. So that, that he probably won't be fit till October, November. Right. Um, the way football is today, particularly if you yeah. have to play 90 on a Saturday to Tuesday on a Saturday, you got to be fit. And otherwise you're going to get injured and hurt. So that, that's a real frustration. And trying to get this across to an agent, to a player, and they think you're hiding behind a salary cap and they think, you're, no, no, there's no hiding. It's out there for all to see. That's the reality. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? I like, see Sunderland signed a striker today, I believe, um, you know, from uh, Danny Graham. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I hadn't seen that. Yeah. I, I think that was confirmed today. Very experienced player on his day, an absolute beast to play against. Probably yeah. not been signing for them. I don't know if, he, if he's been training with them up to now. Brilliant. Then he's fit. But say he hasn't been training. You know, and you're being cheap, you then got a player again that's a few weeks behind, and and you want to hit the ground running, 
And it's tough playing in a team. Suddenly you put a player in there who's only at 60%. Really, really difficult for you, for them, for those around them. It kind of like, so it's going to be one of those messy summers, like you just said there, where starting 11s next week could be very different to the starting yeah. 11 at the end of September or start of October. So how was it being, you know, professional game? It's, uh, it counts for something. It's not friendly anymore. You're in the stadium, nobody there. That must have been pretty surreal. It's shit. Um, yeah. you, you could hear all the managers. You could hear the players. You could hear the officials. Um, yeah, that was interesting, but it was shit. Um, mm. but it, you know, it's like, I suppose, it's, um, it, it's like having loved ones missing, you know, from an important event and yeah. they make it. Um, you know, not having your fans from the minute I drove up to the club to going in and having my temperature checked and walking on the arrows and getting the color code fucking tag I've got to wear to <clears throat> no roast dinner. I love the posh roast dinner, <laughs> Carberry, and I, it would be a bit selfish if I had the chef just cook a carvery for me. Yeah. On that day, you know, and, you bring um, a bag of fish and chips with you. Yeah, just it, it, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't good. Uh, and you know, I, I'd seen the Coventry game last week. Obviously, the last friendly we did at our stadium. Look, the pitch is in great condition. The stadium's getting there. All it's missing is our fans. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so from that point of view, I'm like, come on, you know, let's get this announced. Let's get it out there. Let's get fans back in. I know everyone's losing their shit over 3,000 infections yesterday with a lot of young people who are suddenly infected, but enough of this crap already with lockdowns and stopping people going to work and stopping people being able to go outside and watch sporting events. This is the world we're in now. Mm-hmm. But most countries now have kind of come to the realization you just can't lock people up anymore. It's interesting, you know, I don't want to necessarily go down the rabbit hole, but he, here in Orlando, they've been having uh, fans back in the stadiums again, yeah. which, you know, has been surprising to see that the MLS, after they went through their lockdown, and, you know, they kind of come out the other side of it now, so. Of course, well, um, I mean, yeah, we're not going down the COVID rabbit hole, because that upsets people sometimes, but the reality was, I saw the thing yesterday, the headlines, and Pierce Morgan was out there, and it was, you know, a guy who'd been to France and was eating out with a lot of older people while he was in France, and now he's preaching to everyone about second waves and lockdowns and 3,000 infections in a day. It was really interesting that um, I was going to say to everyone out there, guys, calm down. Like in Florida, we were getting fifteen to 10,000 a day. Everyone was warning, mm-hmm. we're all going to die. And we've got the oldest population in, in, in America. And as it, as, it, as it was found out, it was actually a lot of younger people getting it. Not as many older people, thankfully and fortunately. And we've come out the other side of it because we went through it. And our governor came out the other day and said, I'm not locking down our state again. And, and that's great for a business owner to hear that because these people who own businesses who are stopping and starting and stopping and starting and reading the headlines to hear his their leader, their elected official come out and go, we are not locking you down again. We're not going to shut your business down again. We're going to do things as safely as we can. And we're going to have to get on. And that's kind of what you want to hear in the UK. Instead of right. hearing about, oh, we're now quarantined Greece today. And now we're going to shut down this. And now people can't go back to the office and they can't go back to school. And the papers, this is where we are, you know, and it's just, this is the world we're at as well. And it's going to be like this until probably until the vaccine comes at the end of the year. So that's just, so can we get our fans back in safely as we can? And can we let grown adults, people make decisions for themselves? So what kind of, kind of, protocols did you have coming into the stadium um you know it's obviously it's it's all very well planned uh to have nobody there so that folks don't stay to get don't get close to to each other and um, i sent you, I sent you yeah. a sample of yeah. the i mean god bless dawn britain and, and liz at our club who have to like be the liaison officers with the safety officers and the protocols one was 150 pages mm-hmm. protocol manual the stuff, I don't know if you read any of it, but I, I couldn't. I did. It. Yeah, well, good for you. Um, I'm a speed reader. Anyway, so you, when I got to the club, the security outside the door, you stood in a blue box. There's like a blue sticker on the floor. Mm-hmm. Like, well, what's, what's with a blue box? And he goes, oh, well, I'm, this is where I'm meant to stand. I can't. So you're not allowed to move outside the box? Or <laughs> so then I go through the door. And there's a lovely lady at the desk. She's got a thermometer or whatever to do the temperature. Yeah. Listen, cool as you like. You know, mine was like a flat 36. And then you go through reception and then the stairs have got arrows. So people can't, you can't walk up as someone's coming down. There's, mm-hmm. green, there's green, orange and red areas around the stadium for people who yeah. are not allowed, some are not allowed. Look, it's government protocol. I get it. Somebody had to sit there, get paid to draw up 150 pages of all of this. Uh, for me, yes, probably a lot of it's OTT. But if it saves lives, if it allows people to get in, if it makes sure the older members of staff of ours are protected, we follow it through. You wear your mask. You got to do. I wash my hands twenty times during the day. 
because that habit of shaking people's hands, unfortunately, I still do it and they do it as well. Yeah. You, you, you do it and then you think about it afterwards. No, you don't lose it. I, I met with two agents the other night in the Running Meat Hotel near me here. It's like my meeting zone for when I do deals. And it was two agents and someone's dad. And they all got up and I came in and they shook my hand. And I didn't even mm-hmm. fucking think. Mm-hmm. I shook all their hands and go, shit, I shouldn't have done that. So straight away, I've got my hand sanitizer. <laughs> right. And then you look rude, right? So I, I, I guess we're all like, we're getting on with it as best we can. And the stadium's got all the signs up. But we're ready. We can have fans. Um, and we can do this as best we can. Um, so, again, I know the pilot events are on. And Cambridge United, I think, were part of the pilot yeah. event in Brighton. So I, I'm, I'm, not much, I'm not sure how much longer the government can carry on doing this. Not with a £2 trillion pound debt at the moment. Right. Overhead. So the travel industry is already dead. Now you're, going, now you're killing the sports industry if you keep this up for months and months. So... Uh, yeah, I'm not sure what goes on next, pal. I mean, I mean, yeah. in, in America, you know, lots of the NFL teams, I think they're getting like 20, 30% back in the stadiums mm-hmm. when they start. So some states, and we know those who are, have decided not to, but the majority of the NFL, you know, have got fans back in stadiums. So that's going to be nice to see that normality. I'm kind of surprised golf didn't do it because if there was ever a social distance event, where you could like, yeah. what is it, 20,000 fans go see a golf event. So letting 5,000 fans over eight yeah. holes would kind of be an easy one, right? Right. So I, I am shocked they didn't do that for golf so far. So who knows? Yeah. And, you know, as I look through that manual, um, I mean, there's risk assessments that have been taking place um, to identify, you know, points of failure. Um, you have the three different zones. So I think it was red zone, amber zone, and green zone, which different people can go in depending on, uh, and you got to sign in and you got to basically tell um, the EFL who's in each zone so they know who can go where and who shouldn't be going where. It's interesting, you know. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, carry on. What are you going to say? Yeah, no, what's interesting for me is like a club, you know, a stadium like you've got. Uh, and most uh, teams who, you know, aren't in these brand new purpose-built stadiums, we've got some pretty old stadiums with some, you know, <laughs> some walkways and, you know, not necessarily the best facilities. And, you know, you're kind of trying to figure out how to reconfigure all the facilities behind the scenes so it fits this kind of flow, which means like showers in the car park, for example, you know, for the away team. Um not being able to go in the dressing room, you know, how do you, it's just, it's just fascinating, you know, all the different things you got to think about um, to make it happen. We did, um, I think we did our final bit of testing again the other day as well. And everyone had to before, I think, to start. That was the final prerequisite. Mm-hmm. You had to do the testing again. Yeah, you know what? Uh, yeah, how long can it go on? How long can I, I, I don't know, you know, how long's a piece of string? You've seen the two England players today. Obviously, yeah. They got caught, caught, you know, two young teenage lads out on the pool or whatever else in Iceland. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the funny thing was there, I was nearly going to tweet and go, well, actually, there is no corona in Iceland because they've been so vicious with the lockdown and with, with when you come in, you've got to quarantine. Like, one of my journalist friends rang me five days ago. He was out walking outside the hotel and he just arrived to cover the game. And he told me he had to do his test. He was negative. He had to wait in the hotel five days to do another test. He was allowed out for a walk 20 minutes. He was staying in a four-room hotel. There was only six rooms being used. He said, Iceland's a beautiful place, but it's dead. There's no tourism. Yeah. He said, hey, the good news is they got no COVID. They have no money, but they got no COVID. There's no tourism allowed in. So they're one of those places that society were just going to not let COVID in and yeah. we just like, shut everything down. And we all know, as per Australia and New Zealand, that doesn't work for very long. So what surprised me was, yeah, I, I get the English lads. They shouldn't have done what they did. They're going to get vilified. They're going to get hammered. And, you know, two teenage boys done something stupid. I thought Southgate handled it well today. Um, you know, this is a new world we're dealing with. Football makes mm-hmm. like, stupid mistakes. We've seen that in the past. And they're going to do it a few times. Um, that's just the way it is, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. You know, on the outside, you look at it like you say and think, I mean, how stupid can you get? But on the other hand, I always like to think that, you know, we, we don't live in their shoes. Oh. So you don't necessarily know the environment. And I mean, yeah, you remember being, they... and right. being wanted by everyone and being, you know, famous. And every woman and every man and whatever else wants to either be with you or be you. You, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's tough. These young people who go into sport and become suddenly in the spotlight, you know, it's tough for some of these kids and the mistakes and the choices they make. They make some stupid ones early on. Um, right. Look, and unfortunately for both Greenwood uh, and Foden, who are two great young English players, they made a cardinal error. I mean, fucking stupid, yes. Um, but now I guess they're going to have to pay the price. And unfortunately, it's, you know, two great lads. 
Yeah. Well, I got a last question before we go into our fans forum, um, and that's just if there's any updates on um, any bailouts or securing loan pack loan packages. You know, I've seen all kinds of things that the Premier League is willing to give money, but then it's contingent upon a bunch of crazy things and. The EFL saying we're going to go and secure a big um, bunch of money and then we're going to start distributing it. And yet it seems to just continue to go on and on and on. So here we are six months down the line. And from what I'm getting told, there's nothing imminent. Okay. Um, and that's really frustrating. My CEO on our behalf is ringing every every Tuesday and Wednesday. And I, I could be wrong, but the time the podcast comes out, I pray. Mm-hmm. And there's a deal done and great. But so far, I know nothing. And that okay. is so disappointing. It's beyond belief. So mm. same old broken record, I guess. All right. I guess we'll continue to watch this space. Yeah. Um, all right, then. Well, we're going to go into a break now, and then we'll be back um, the other side with supporters from a variety of different clubs from around the country, just uh, having a chat, see how they feel about their upcoming season. Oh, um, who's coming on? Uh, we got supporters, let's see, from um bolton so i can have a nice conversation about the cup with them um we have uh let's see who is in uh let's see i'm having a look at my sheet here rochdale wimbledon cool. um derby preston and leeds awesome good list let's awesome. see you after the break guys all right we'll be back soon So hi there, everybody, and welcome back to the Hard Truth Podcast. And we're really going to go and do a, a, a round table with fans from across the divisions to talk about season previews. Like, what are we expecting for our teams? What are we expecting for the division itself? And uh, kind of talk about hopes and fears for the new season. Uh, we'll start with League Two. We'll go to League One, the Championship, and then the Premier League. And hopefully by the end of it, we're not all fighting with each other. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Although uh, that means that I got to keep uh, keep my mouth closed about Leeds, which you know they're in a much better position than we are, so they've got plenty on me. And um, yeah, no rivalry, no squabbles today on the pod. So I want to start with uh, League Two, and for League Two, I'm joined by Henry Hewitt, who's a Bolton fan, and Alan Higgins, who like me is a Bradford City fan. So I'll try not to talk too much. Maybe Dara's going to have to. Uh, put his foot down and tell us to stop talking about Bradford uh, too much. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start just by going to uh, Henry, first of all. Um, first of all, commiserations on the weekend. I uh, guess. Don't remind me. What a, what a poor start to the season. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was surprising for us as well, to be honest, because, you know, for, for listeners, basically Bradford beat Bolton uh, first day of the season. And, you know, going into that, we didn't have very high hopes. So, oh. uh, yeah. Nobody likes, nobody likes a fucking bragger. Well, <laughs> I, got, I got to tell you, Daryl, you know, we've had a couple of years of, you know, not very good football. So I got to make the most out of it when we win. <laughs> um, you know, you've had, what, 15, 16 players come in so far? I mean, what's the general feeling at Bolton right now? Well, until Saturday at five o'clock, it was very optimistic, to be honest. Um, no, I think, um, obviously, we, we understand the situation we're in. It's a new start. And after what happened last summer, um, you know, a lot of fans are saying that we shouldn't still have this, but we're lucky to be here attitude. But I, I think you've got to, you have got to have that. You know, you've got to be uh, brutally honest. But I think there's a, the optimism's there because... You know, we've not been in this league for, we've been in once in our 140-odd year history. So I think for a lot of fans, maybe it's naive optimism thinking that we're going to steamroll the the league. Um, And then when we were signing the likes of Owen Doyle and Anthony Sartovic, who have done very well in this league, um, yeah, a lot of people are very optimistic. But I think personally, I think we do need to keep our feet on the ground a bit. It's not going to be a steamroller. We're going to... You know, I think we've we've all got to be in it together, and we've got to realise that actually um, there will be results out there that won't look good on the sc- you know, and, and the the sheet. Henry, can... Henry you, you, you're a big scalp, so every every club's going to like raise their game twenty percent. Um, yeah, exactly. Portsmouth um, fans, Coventry fans, Bradford fans, a la Phil will tell you. You know, that's that's what you have to adapt to more than anything else. Every time you play a game, right? 
Yeah, exactly. And, you know, coming up the motorway and seeing the, the University of Bolton staging, for a lot of these players, it's going to be, you know, it's, it's the biggest, probably the biggest league stadium that they've played in. So, yeah, we've got to deal with that. And I think that's Ian Everett and the, the owners have mentioned that in pre-season, which is good because they understand that and they're trying to get that mentality. But I think for the fans, it's important to have that mentality. We are a big scout, but also understand it's a building process and, if it, you know, what's, it's, what's, what's with the management change, by the way? Because I thought, I thought Hilly was the type of manager, particularly with young players and everything else, the experience of the league too. I, I was really surprised they got rid of him. Um, what, what was the general feeling with the fans with the new manager versus getting rid of the old experienced manager? Well, when he came in, he came in with Dave Flickcroft, his assistant, and the two Bolton lads. So it was kind of like we, we one club, one town kind of attitude. Yeah. But as it went on, I think, as you know, now, Keith Hill's a very outspoken guy. He's, a, he's like a, a, a frustrated philosopher. So some of the, you know, terms saying he knows his onions and stuff like that, I think when you it was always going to be a tough season. We knew that. But when you're then bottom of the league and he's, he's coming out with some of the things he was saying, I think it rubbed a few fans up the wrong way. Uh, personally, I liked it. I thought it was something different. But um, I, I think for Keith Hill... We needed someone to come in for last season and we, we could never move forward with a points deduction and then there was a, a potential one looming over us for a half season as well because we missed the Doncaster game a few years ago. Um, so, yeah, so I just think it weren't, it just wasn't the right time for him. But I, I think for the fresh start that we, we needed someone like Ian Abbott and it might be the wrong decision. Keith Hill might have been the guy we should have kept hold of, but I guess we'll wait and see. Who's doing the deals there, by the way? Who's bringing all these players in? Who's the director of football? Um, well, we've got a head of football operations. I think that's the name that they've given him. He's called Tobias Phoenix. So he was at Macclesfield and then came over to, to us. Um, he's a very, he, you know, we don't know much about him. He, he likes to just do the business and, and stay out of the limelight. But, um, you know, he's, he's brought in 16 players and you've got to say that he's done a good job so far, but it depends on how these players are, how they fit into the system. And um, yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I know it's, for the season. Yeah, it's, it's kind of cliche, but I mean, it's going to take a while for those players to start really being able to play off each other. And, you know, the weekend, it just got a bit disjointed, um, which you would expect to see, you know, something like that when, um, you know, you're kind of hoofing balls up front and, and asking your strikers to run after them. Uh, there, there wasn't that much kind of cohesion, but I mean, you're again, I, well, you're getting personal. Yeah. <laughs> you're getting a style of football. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I'm talk about styles of football. I could talk about um, Phil Parkinson and uh, you know the stick that he used to get um, for his style of football, but it worked for us. Um, you know, I guess you know you had Phil Parkinson as well, but again, we can sp- probably spend the next uh, forty-five minutes talking about Parky. So, um, what's your expectations for the season? Um, well, we're favourites for a reason, so you've got to you've got to think that. Um, but you know, like I said, I think it's just about being realistic. I don't think we'll get off to a strong start, to be honest, with the amount of players we've brought in. So it's important not to panic. It's important to um, you know just stick behind the team and hopefully, because Ian Everett's bringing in a new, he's trying to bring in a new style of football. The, he he did his press conference today ahead of the EFL Trophy game against Crew tomorrow and he pointed out that we did 19 passes in the build up to our goal on Saturday and, and as you know watching Phil Parkinson that's something we've not been used to yeah. um, so uh, so I think it's just going to take time and it's important to, to just stick behind it but I, I think you know we, we're favourites and I think if we finish outside the playoffs it will be a bit of a disaster season you won't yeah it's it's okay. one of those things you got, you got to get out as quickly as you can though because you get sucked into League Two, and before you know it, speaking from personal experience, you've been there for six years, and you're just thinking, what the hell happened? <laughs> it's not well, pretty. <laughs> what are you trying to do to this poor guy? He's full of optimism. I know. He's, <laughs> OP. He's like, you get behind a team, and you're going, oh, if you don't get out of that league, you're fucked for you. <laughs> oh, I, think, I think I've got some scars. There's some scar, <laughs> scars that still need to... Uh, Eric, don't worry. You're going to be fine. All right? It's a good club. You know, they'll take a bit of adjusting. My prediction, comfortably top five, either automatic, in the playoffs. A club the size of Bolton ends up in the playoffs. They got odds on to win. Yeah, well, you, you mentioned scars. We've got enough scars over the last few years. Yeah. So we're just happy to be... Uh, we're happy 
to be functioning as a normal football club again. So that's a, that's a win in our eyes, I guess. Hundred mm-hmm. percent. Well done, Paul. So, Alan, I want to come over to you and, um, you know, take the, the other Bradford fans' opinion. We were in a <laughs> similar place to where Henry was, I think, this time last season, thinking, you know what, we're going to be here for a year, we'll be back up, no problems, and didn't quite pan out like that. You know, is it going to be any different this year, do you reckon? Uh, I'm in the slightly concerned camp, to be honest with you. Um, I look at the squad numbers that came out last week, and I think, it's pretty much what we had last year. And when I walked out of Salford before lockdown, it was in the top five worst I've seen. And we've been served up a lot of rubbish in the last couple of years, as you know yourself. So I am slightly concerned. I'm concerned where goals are going to come from um, defensively as well. Saturday was a good result. Um, but again, as you've already covered, it was a good time to play Bolton. And I think early on is a good time to play him. Uh, as the season goes on, I think they'll get a lot stronger. But uh, I am slightly concerned. I think we need possibly three, maybe four, I'd say, personally. But Stuart, you, I think we're relying a lot on Stuart to get that little bit extra out of some people that maybe Gary Bowyer couldn't. Uh, which... Alan, are they, are they, are they going to bring in... Have they actually said they're going to bring in more players or is that it? I mean, I mean what's, the, what's the actual... Uh, perception from the club regarding the official the, the saw said they might get, they're looking for a couple more uh, they're waiting on answers from premier league clubs from the sounds of it looks like it might be loans i think they're obviously after a striker because they've let james vaughan go and we are we haven't got a natural right back as it were we've got a couple of right wingers that can play right wing back and a couple of center halves that can maybe slot in there uh, but as right backs go we haven't actually got one um so I think they're looking for that. But other than that, they've not really said much more. I think Stuart's fairly happy with what he's got, other than maybe the, those two, from what they're saying. What striker do you want? To be honest, the striker's graveyard that Valley Parade seems to be, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, I think from what it sounds like, they're sounding like they're trying to pick up a bit of a, a loan gem. A bit of, I'd hope for something like what Tyler Walker was a few years ago when he first went into League Two and obviously built up and up. But I think the trouble is with that, if they come in and they score lots of goals, then come January, they're not going to be here. So... Always the problem. It's a tricky one. It's, um, But yeah, I mean, we've gone down the experience route with James Vaughan. Doyle didn't work out. So I struggle to know what's, what's going to be for the best, really. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we're waiting for them to pull a rabbit out of the hat with a striker because it seems like it is going to go the loan route and we haven't had much luck when we've tried loan players coming in the last few years, up front at least. No, I think, I think that's exactly what they're trying to do. It's going to be some youngster who's going to come in and shock everybody or somebody who's already there. Um, like Curtis Guthrie, we didn't see much of him last year, but what we did wasn't that impressive. But I think mm-hmm. maybe hoping someone like him, match with the Stewart factor, who might get that bit extra out of him. But it's it's a long shot, I think, personally. But we'll have to see see what happens. You never know. Dara, I got a question for you. You know, as an outsider, you, we have this love affair with Stuart McCall. Um, you know, so many of us, he was like, it was my hero growing up as a player. And you know, we a lot of us loved Stuart being in charge. But as an outsider, do you look at that and think, eh, you know, maybe we've got some rose tinted glasses on um, when we're oh. happy to have a manager like Stuart or? I listen, Stuart's team have beaten us before. Um, you know, um, I think he's an honest manager. I think, you know, when you have a manager with the blood runs through them, and it really is Bradford, it helps a lot with the fans that they're having a shit time. Um, I think he deserves a proper go. Um, he obviously knew the limitations when he was going in. So he, he can never make that. You know, you hear managers say, oh, I need backing, I need players, I need this. And I was like, well, hang on. You took the fucking job. And I'm sure you asked the questions when you took the job, you know, if I got the budget to sign Messi or have I got the budget to sign someone from Bognor Regis? So um, he's probably well aware of what he had to deal with. He probably likes the challenge. Um, I presume his family are in the area. He's probably got a lot of affiliation to the area. Um, yeah, I, I think he'll be okay. I, you know, I know you're all dreading this season, whatever else, but I would just say at the moment, look, trust the manager. That's all you can do. Um, you know, there's, I, I can sense the apprehension from both your stuff on there about, you know, what's going to happen. But, you know, you're a big club, like Bolton. Too big a club for League Two. It's a fucking disgrace both of those football clubs are in League Two. Um, so, and it's only a matter of time before you rise again. 
um, you know, Coventry were in League Two, they're now in the champ. You know, so many clubs you've seen have the shit kicked out of them and they come back. Unfortunately, I've watched too many of them bypass us at the moment and, you know, like stop that and get up there. So, but I wouldn't be too concerned, you know. All will be good. So, Alan, what's your expectation for the season then? Uh, personally, I'd love the playoffs, um, but I think it's going to be similar to last year and I think we're going to be ninth, 10th, that sort of area where we tease the playoffs mm-hmm. just to keep us just to keep us on 10 tilts like they do. But, uh, yeah, I'd love to play. I think the playoffs would be a really good result for us, but I think we're going to be looking at them sort of nine for 10, personally. Hopefully it, I'm wrong. It feels like it really does depend on who we're able to bring in before they close the window. It feels that there's so many gaps and there's talk about bringing folks in, but um, it's what you do with those. If we actually are able to close those, it's going to be the big difference maker. Yeah, I think so. I think you're right. Yeah, I think if if they get the right side, even if it is only two, if they get the right two, then it can make a difference. I mean, you know, we know Stuart's going to play good football and it's going to be entertaining. Um, but obviously, like you said, it needs to be the right people. But mm-hmm. it's uh, there'll be a lot of teams in League Two in the same position, won't there? So it's yeah, it's it's um, interesting, Dara. One of the things I see in League Two, you know, is it's almost like a fight to just be mid-table because this, this is where the financial problems are going to hit the most. Um, and so if, if, so if a lot of the clubs there can just, um, and I'd love if you think the same, uh, if they can just survive the season, get out unscathed, rebuild again next year, um, I think, yeah, that's I, job done. Yeah, I think everyone doesn't know what tomorrow brings at the moment. Um, you know, clubs like Bradford and Bolton, it's worth an extra 20 points a year with their fan bases. Mm-hmm. I, that might sound like far-fetched, but I do think clubs with those fan bases, you go to Bradford with 15,000 people screaming, bolt in that magnificent stadium. It's what it gives the, their own players. It, what it does to intimidate the away fans. Nobody knows what the fuck this year is going to bring anyone because everyone doesn't know whose squads are what, how the window's going to end, the salary cap. Um, you know, God help the bookies having to make like odds <laughs> and take bets in this shit. Is it's got to be like the most difficult year for that kind of crap going on. Um, so we're all just happy, I guess, to get football back on. And we're all happy when we finally can get back in stadiums to watch. And I guess it's almost like you'll take what you get. Yeah. You know, and, and probably some shit owners are going to get away with things this year because you're going to have fans who are so thirsty to get in and watch football. They'll forget about screaming at the owners and, you know, moaning at the manager and the team. They just want to go watch their team play. So, you, you know, COVID's probably done a few of those owners a favour. Um, and then you're going to have, obviously, clubs who are probably, if there's no bailout, I would imagine, yeah, there could be some tricky times ahead for a couple of clubs. Not as many as I thought before, but probably a couple of clubs, for sure. All right, well, let's move on to um, League One. And Henry Allen, I want to really thank you for joining us today um, to talk League Two. So League One, I'm joined by Jacob Wright, who is a Rochdale supporter, Martin Lambert from Ipswich Town and uh, Stu Deacons from AFC Wimbledon. And we'll start actually with Stu. Um, so this is the year when you finally return to Plough Lane. Is that still on the cards? Yeah, it's all going ahead at the moment. So it's really exciting. Um, we're, due to, yeah, we're due to get the keys, probably quite a big set of keys, um, end of October. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, I've, been a, I've been a fan for 30 years. I did one year at Plough Lane and that got me hooked. Um, and I've been a... I've been around the I've been around many different grounds until then. So to finally get back to Pell Lane, that's really matter what happens in the season. I'm gonna be a very happy person. Yeah. No, it's interesting you say that because that's kind of one of the questions I was going to bring up was around kind of long term aspirations. You know, for now it's you've obviously done fantastic to get to where you are, and a lot of other teams are very envious of the position you're in. And every year seems like it's a bit of a struggle, but you got your home back. Like, what's what, is, what does success really look like for AFC Wimbledon? I think for us, it's, a time, it's, it's really growing, really. Um, we're heavily involved in our community. Um, so it's really about making sure, you know, uh, COVID's been a really bad thing for everybody. But, you know, we've done some really good things in the community with the Don's Local Action Group. And, and we've shown already that the community is quite, you know, quite important to Wimbledon. So that was one of the big things about going home. Um, really, it's about growing a fan base. Um, we're going into a ground now that it's not. It's going to be about nine thousand three hundred, but that's double the size of Kings Meadow. Um, it's now really, you know, once you've got a base in, in Wimbledon, it's really about growing that and um, that success. What happens after that? A fan zone club. There's ceilings. I think we have to understand that. Uh, there's a ceiling on things. Um, 
but I think you know, for me, um, from where we were, you know, we started at Combine Counties back in two thousand two. Yeah. Um, you know, to have teams like Hull and and even you know, I'll, I'll say now Darrow's here and Peterborough coming down to to Plough Lane is is great. So success with really is is growing, um, but understanding limitations because you know naturally new fans come to new clubs and they they have that sort of why are you not spending X Y Z on players and it's understanding the history and the culture. It's a it's a great club, and and I obviously tried to buy it. You know, before I remember, and um, you know, Little Ivor is a pal of mine. Um, you know, who does so much great work behind the scenes. Um, and himself and Xavier Wiggins at the time were very much architects and trying to get me to do it. And it was, it was yeah. Eric, is it Eric Samuelson? That's was, correct, yes. He, he was the guy who met me in Richmond and basically kind of looked down his nose at me with my diamond watch on and said, look, we don't want that type of bone in our club ever again. Um, we just want a club that can survive and we can bring our families to watch and we're not interested in all the stuff that goes with promotions. And to be fair to him, he's been there since day one. And, you know, at the time, I might not have liked what he said to me because I was this young 29-year-old guy wanting to buy a club and I want to get to the Premier League and all this kind of thing. You'd been through so much shit at the club with the scars, the battle scars, that, you know, it was kind of like you went in the best direction and you got there anyway. And to finally have your home back and to have your own... I, I know there are some private investors who've loaned money or done bonds or whatever else, but it's still very much a family fan-owned club which is great for football and the romance and the fairy tale and whatever else. So I, I've got nothing but good stuff for Wimbledon for that vote. But uh, every time, and, and obviously every time we go there, we fucking lose. But I've got nothing but good things for football. So it'd be, it'd be great to visit the, the, the lane. Are we calling it the lane now when you go back and you know, visit the lane when it's called? Yeah, I'll set off that for Plough Lane. Um, <laughs> It's a way, you're right. I know, I know Xavier. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I know he's a, he's a good lad. Um, I think you're right. There's, there's battle scars. And, you know, you don't want to give your ownership away. Uh, and the Don's Trust was very much about having a controlling, you know, um, we, can't, we can't be sold. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the key thing. We did come with some challenges. Don't get me wrong. You know, December, we, we didn't have the money. We were, we were probably about five million short. Uh, and, you know, thankfully, we, we arranged a Plough Lane bond and raised five million pounds. Thankfully, thankfully, just before COVID come in, because I don't know how that would have been, and, and maybe maybe the sun is shining on us, maybe a little bit with that. But face, good face. Yeah, yeah. I think it is sometimes. But you know, we've raised we've raised the benches this year. So part of um, Wimbledon is is raising ten year debentures. So to try and get some money into the wages, it's going to be a challenge. The, the, the best thing we've got, the lucky thing we've got, is we invest heavily in our academy. Um, so the salary the salary cap and the rules around it probably we're okay. We've got you know I think in the squad already we've got eight um, eight players under twenty one. Um, we've got a good academy, so hopefully that will help us with a few experienced pros. And we've got we've got the guy obviously you let go, Alex Woodyard, who I really like already. Woody is a great fit. They're great fit. They do really, really like him. Really like him. He's a player we haven't had before. He's a he's just someone that hassles people and gets amongst them. Uh, and we need that sort of experience, even though he's what twenty seven or so forth. He's got a lot of experience in the league. He's got an engine on him like a truck. He just never stops running. So he'll do real. But listen, give me the name of the best. Uh, academy graduate you've got in your team this year? Well, we've got a few. Um, we've got you Paul Lossi. Who's the next few. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you <laughs> too much information, Dara, <laughs> on that side of it. Um, we've got a few. Um, we've got a few that have been through a little bit. Paul Cannonby, he's coming through now. He's, he's like a tank. Uh, Paul Lossi. Um, we've got a few good ones. We've got Zach Robinson, who's just come through as well as a forward. Um, and sometimes, you know what, you've got to chuck these kids in. Um, in, in a situation like COVID, you're right. What you were saying before, no one knows his lead. The transfer market is dead at the moment. No right. one knows what the strength. No one knows what strength is going to be right. So, you know, what's the best chance? Put the kids in, let them learn. That's why you got to do it. Listen, we might get some good fees. We might spend a bit of money on players, young players, or whatever else. But sprinkled with that is always the young players we want to bring through. Do you know what I mean? And, and it's for clubs like ours. And I put, you know, in that bracket, Peterborough Wimbledon at the moment, you know what I mean? You'll probably surpass us with your new shining stadium. But our, our clubs always are fighting above our weight, punching above our weight to a certain extent. So you need that sprinkle of young talent, you know what I mean? And particularly homegrown, which gives fans an even bigger smile. I've always said that, you know what I mean? It gives you a sense of pride when you're a football fan. That, oh, he's one of ours. And that's like key, you know what I mean? So look, I wish you guys all the best yeah. this season. I mean, with the move back to the lane. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Jay. I want to bring in um, Jacob. Jacob is a Rochdale supporter. Um, That's right. My first question, I guess, is, you know, how has COVID hit Rochdale? What's the general feeling, you know, going into the new season? 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, the pandemic has kind of hit everyone um, in its own right. But I think we seem to have been hit really hard with it. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. Um, our chairman has come out recently and said there's like a, well, there's a 1.8 million almost black hole as to, in, in regards to finance. So uh, for a club the size of Rochdale, averaging three and a half thousand pounds, I would imagine 1.8 million pounds is a lot of money um, to, to go missing. And, uh, you know, coupled that with the loss of basically 10 players from, from our team mm-hmm. last year, um, it seems to have hit us just at the wrong time um, because I think realistically with the kept Ian Henderson, Callum Camps, you know, the, you know, our two main attacking threats, if you like, if it wasn't for the pandemic, um, that's for sure. Is Ian Henderson going to be a big miss, you think? Um, yes, yes. Yeah. I think there's no doubt about that. I mean, a striker who's guaranteeing you 20 goals a season. Um, Priceless. Priceless. But, yeah, and, and I'm pretty I'm gobsmacked he's not got a League One club. You know, I'm sure Salford have waved a, a few pound notes at him, for mm-hmm. sure. Exactly, Darren. Turn around and go. Oh, there's a plenty of chilling right there. <laughs> that's right. Listen, yeah, exactly. So that's so that's the power that we haven't got as a. <laughs> no, let me um, tell you, be yeah, away uh, what a signing! Great signing for Salford. It is, it is, and you know, take away Callum Camps as well. Who I, I believe you were probably after as well, Dara. Uh, I don't know if I'm. Oh, right no, right. no. To be fair, we 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 had a deal agreed with your club last summer. We were giving okay. your club nearly four hundred grand last summer. The deal was agreed. Um, the player geographically didn't want to come mm-hmm. um, and we don't want to chase people who don't want to come because of geography. Um, yeah. Wonderful young player. We'd identified him two years before um, and then we were approached again, you know, there might be a chance and we were like, no, we've moved on because, you know, we'd obviously got other players and whatever else. So I don't, we, I don't know who else was in. I know Fleet would pick them up on a free yeah. and, you know, unfortunately, Rochdale would have got off us probably 400 grand, a big sell-on. Exactly. Come off. That's the business, but they were tough to negotiate with fair play to Rochdale. But we did get there this time last year. I want to say it was August when we finally agreed a deal, and the player was him and and horn, him and and horn. And listen, it was what it was. When we beat you 6 0 and I watched the performance, I was like, I was kind of glad I didn't spend a 400 grand on him. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, well, no, the 6 0 game, that was a strange one because I remember it, I think we we're an hour into the game, we'd had 71%. You dominated. dominated. Uh, dominated. Down. <laughs> yeah, dominated. Your manager plays possession-based football. Absolutely sure. dominated us possession-wise. And we're like 6-0 up. <laughs> like yeah. the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, yeah no, that was definitely the strange. And, and that, that kind of uh, couples with, with what our style of play is about. It's either a car crash as it was at your place or it can be absolutely wonderful. And, and I love the gaffer for that. You know, he, he's, he sticks to it no matter what. Love it. You know, love we, it. Went to, we went to Old Trafford and played the exact same way. Uh, and you know we've got some good young lads coming through like um, like Wimbledon that seems to have mentioned so yeah it's going to be an interesting who season who have you got who have you got coming through who <laughs> who this is turning into a scouting session <laughs> hey, hey, <laughs> I'm, working on, I'm working on the job here yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you'll be fine you're a really good club you're well run um, you know you've always produced good players you have got a terrific manager the style of football is excellent. Um, I, I don't think you should have concerns, do you know what I mean, at all. So, like I said, it's an unknown league this year. None of us know. Exactly. Yeah, you know? And yeah I, th- I, think, uh, I think the league's wide open for anyone, really. Uh, I, I was more glass half empty before Saturday. And then we put in a really good performance where I was field and, and beat them, which, was, which, which kind of brings the optimism back, I suppose. Um, but yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to the season now. Um, I just love watching the way we play. And like I said, Darren, right. it can be a car crash. <laughs> well, all the best. <laughs> yeah. <a> good one. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jacob. I want to bring in uh, Martin now. Martin is an Ipswich Town supporter. Um, you know, I think you probably came into League One last year thinking that this is a really good opportunity to get back up. It didn't quite go to plan. Um, I'd love to know kind of what you're thinking on this year. Is it same ob- same expectations, same objectives, or um, you know, a, a year wiser? You know, are we thinking that things might turn out different this year? Well, we're hoping so, that's for sure. Mm. I mean, it's September, so I'm drinking the Kool-Aid and I'm, we're winning the league, you know, uh, 100 <laughs> points, 100 goals. You know, if, if you don't start the season optimistic, then you've only got one way to go. I love uh, it. <laughs> you where it's got to be. But yeah, last year's got some scars. Yeah. Uh, I think listening to, to Bradford fans there, I think we can kind of sort of recognise that we kind of, you know, we kind of come into League One thinking sort of a, a, a pit stop a one year out of the championship then we'll we'll go back again and hit it hard and and we got found out a little bit to be honest with you mm-hmm. but i mean the majority of the fan base 
I mean, Paul Lambert's been sacked four times this week on Twitter alone. So um, they're already starting on centre hooks, whereas I'm probably the only town fan that's optimistic. So why is he? Why is he not popular? Because he's a manager with pedigree. You know what he did with Norwich. He's done with, why? Why is he not popular? What is it about Lambert that like winds fans up for such? Well, I, I think a little, a little element of it is going to be that, that first name you mentioned there in Norwich. I think, you know, everyone, everyone, everyone can bury it when it's going well, but the moment it, 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 does, it sours a little bit, it's, oh, you know, he's ex-Norwich manager. But I think a large, large majority don't like his team selection. It's a bit like uh, the lottery draw, you know, so they set of balls is uh, Camelot and it's, it's always rotation policy last year. And that's because we've got it's just a huge bloated squad. Uh, so if you do want a couple of players, Dara, I can point a few out because we've got such a large squad. <laughs> Couldn't afford them. <laughs> Couldn't afford them. <laughs> but yeah, so it's 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 rotation. It and it's uh, just a, a muddled start. Are you, are you happy with the with the recruitment recently? With the experienced players they've signed? No, no, no. I would I I do a podcast and I we always yearn for the the Peterborough recruitment. Uh, system because you guys, as you say, they're at Cannon Camps. You, you've identified him two years before. You've got the, a fill of the market. You know what's coming up. So if you do lose Tony, which you did, you know who's coming through. It always seems to be a, a we're reaction. We're not, you know, we're not proactive. We're reactive. And uh, yeah, no, I get that. I, I look. I live my life by like a model of Plan B because Plan A always goes fucking haywire. So yeah, you know, you, you almost everything you do, whether it's personally, business, whatever, always have a Plan B. Because if you don't have a plan B, you're a fucking gobshite. You know, and that's, that's always been my way. You know what I mean? So I, I get what you're saying there about reactionary, you know, whatever else, and, and moving when you need to move. Yeah, and last year was like, it's a prime example. We, we told Will Key and we, we weren't, wouldn't be signing him. Uh, and then nothing happened, nothing happened. Ah, who's left available? Will Key. So we brought Will Key back in. Um, and he was our third strike of all season, you know. And, and to many fans, that's, that's our recruitment policy. Happened a couple of years before that with Luke Varney. You know, it, it's always been that sort of case where we're just standing still. And similarly, as you, you point out early in, the, early in the show about teams bypassing you, well, you know, Burnley, etc. They've all flown past us, you know, over the time. So I, I, I've spoken to Marcus loads of times during COVID because obviously we were talking about the votes and whatever else. And, and I know I used to do Zoom calls with all the other owners. Marcus would always have his uh, camera off. I'd be like, listen, Marcus, I know what you look like. You don't have to hide from me, you know, but. And I've had personal conversations with him, and I've always found him a really, really cool guy. And I, I, and I found him a guy who, who generally like, wants to do well. And I know he's not overly popular with a lot of the Ipswich you know, fan base and whatever else. And it, 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 is it him? Is it the manager? Is it the people doing the football stuff? Though? What is it that pisses the Ipswich fans off about Marcus? It's, it, I, well, a lot of things. That's, that's a very loaded question. Um, primarily, it's, it's the investment. It's that, it's that reactiveness in the, in the market, not the proactiveness. It's, it's a lot of things. Like we, there's always negativity about the club. You know? It's all about what we can't do, why we can't do it. Instead of just being, you know, we're town. We're a big fish in, the, in League One. Massive. This is what we're going to do. This is why we're going to do it. And, and this is the plan. Instead, they come out and say, you know, we'll win the league. We're okay. Well, okay. Well, how are you going to do it? Tell me how you're going to do it. And then we see results that don't quite match with the, with the words. But it's, it is investment. A lot of people feel we don't quite invest enough. But I, I get a lot of people say he's a lovely guy. He just doesn't quite understand or know a lot about football. So I don't know who's um, you know, in his ear. I hear at times you guys may have been advising him, which you know, I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, Listen, don't be blaming me. <laughs> oh, actually, not on there, all right? All right, let me tell you, if I was advising anyone around the club, they'd be doing all right, all right? Don't be, don't, don't be <laughs> Send Barry me. Fried down our way, will you? Can somebody like that, you know? Do you know what? I, I'm astonished. Like, Baza has been with me 15 years, and I know he's 75, but fuck me, he's like a 29-year-old, and, and, and I've just been on the phone to him there and emailed him with him over, over a deal. And I am always astonished. Whether or not it's his persona to the public eye and people think he's like a dinosaur, he is sharp as fuck as a director of football. And I've always been astonished in Ipswich or whoever having come in and gone, listen, we'll give you a double what that Mac Anthony's paying you. And, and they'd have to give me a fee for him, of course. But we'll, you know, we'll do that because a guy like him at a club that's in transition that's say come down from a, a, a top height, just to get two years of stability and get back up again before you want to go down the young European cool model of director of football or head of football or whatever else and bring in a French guy or a German guy or whatever you might do, I, I'm always astonished by it. Big clubs who've got in trouble. Not one phone call, never. 
Uh, and, and it just, it, it, right, I don't get it. I really, really don't get it when I see some no. of these books. Don't get no, it. I, I don't either. I I'm don't not advising Marcus, trust me. No, well, in that case, I wish you were, because uh, we might have Barry Fry. But I think it's that sort of, we've never had that man between Marcus and, and, and you know, and the manager. We've always, you know, McCarthy seemed to run the, the whole show, and that's a big job for any manager, even from pedigree of Mick McCarthy. Or you've had, like, Leo Neal, who's more of a data scientist, or uh, as some people call him, a PE teacher, because he used to be a PE teacher. You know, it's never had that Barry Fry, you know, you, guy who's done it. And You, you need it. Between the owner and the manager, everyone can have a relationship. But we have a, it's me, the manager, and Barry. Yes, I have co-owners, but I'm, football is my remit. Uh, and, and the three of us are very involved in everything we do. Like today, the three of us have spoken six times about two players and whatever else, and targets, plan B, plan C, and what if this doesn't happen, and whatever. And it's always good to have that bounce off each other. And ultimately, I will do the deal and, and approve it. Uh, and you know that's just the way it works really well and, and, uh, and that synergy for me is essential and it also ensures as a new owner you don't get your pants pulled down if you've got someone with experience in the game who knows the ins and outs the, the, the agents the, the good ones the bad ones the whatever else so yeah always astonished by it you know what I mean but you know yeah. I appreciate your comments yeah you, you talked about um, having a large squad. Has, has the salary cap impacted that? Has the number of folks you can register impacted that? Or are you getting it under control anyway? Well, we, we are trying to offload a couple of players. And, and recently, you know, there's been news of apparently not. Okay. <laughs> but no, 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 no. It's tough. I'm saying it's tough. It's tough trying to offload players. This oh, for month, sure. Yeah. It is tough. It's so tough at the moment. Yeah. yeah and the salary cap is not uh, a friend of ours. And that's another reason why this year is, is, is twice as urgent because any any longer uh, length of time in this division now with the salary cap it's just it's just gonna it's gonna hurt us but we are if you look at the squad we're in a transitional year because we've got players entering the last year of their deals we've got young players that are not maybe quite ready to to hit the big stage so we've got that that when that kind of you know no man's land of not, they're not quite ready but the older pros are approaching the end of maybe their time here and it's now or never but it's there's no one in their prime standing out you know apart from Caden Jackson which I know <laughs> did try and sign <laughs> and uh <laughs> they stole them from us that deal was done i had that boy on the phone his family it was done and then obviously ipswich marcus got wind of it peter was signing the striker we're gonna go after that and and i said to caden at the time do not go to the championship you're not ready you need a year in league one and uh look he's a good he's a good young he's, a good, he's not young anymore but he's a good, good player, player. Yeah, yeah very good player love his pace yeah, no, yeah, credible. Yeah, the only real pasty player we've, we've, we've kind of got, um, yep. which when teams come in and dig in, you, you need that to, to break them down because they, they do come to Portland Road and, and say we'll beat us. And last year, we, we certainly couldn't do that. <laughs> Fair enough. But Dara, any final words on League One and how uh, you, know, you think no, League's I, I, shaping I, up this year? People say, who's going to win? Who's favourite? So, I have no idea. I've no idea what Sunderland look like, what Ipswich look like. You know, you've got your Fleetwoods of the world. You know, you've got the clubs that have come down. It, it's a real unknown. Um, I know we've pretty much got all the same players bar one. Um, it, it, it's just an unknown. I don't know. Um, ask me again at Christmas, because I guess that's what it's going to be, because there's also some clubs that have come up. And we spoke to Coventry the other day, and they played a lot of clubs pre-season. And the best club they said they'd play pre-season was Swindon. Interesting. And Swindon have just come up from League Two. Yeah. So... You, you, you know, fair play. You know, you, you just don't know how pre-season's gone and how it's all going to taper out. Um, you have your bookies' favourites. Sunderland and Ipswich are always going to be big favourites up there. Portsmouth because they're big, big clubs. Um, but in the age of COVID, um, we're all equals, I think. Um, so it's going to be really interesting the, the months ahead. All right. Well, thanks a lot for joining us. Um, to uh, Stu, to Martin, to Jacob. Um, we're going to move... Back into the championship and um from let me see from preston north end we have peter peter Seddon. uh thanks for joining us peter uh, cheers for having me guys and thanks for your patience um so all right. i've got enough i'm a preston fan you better be patient <laughs> <laughs> so so um that being said is this um you know is mid table another is that the goal again this season or is um is there enough there to make you think, you know what, this time we might go a little bit further? We, last last season was frustrating. I think COVID killed us. Um, 
So we were we were really pushing on. I think we beat Charlton away and then we went top of the league only for 24 hours. But when you're competing against teams, well, when you're ahead of teams like Leeds and West Brom, there's no ceiling. Mm-hmm. And then COVID happened. Our captain at the time decided he didn't want to, he wasn't going to sign a contract. He's gone to Salford, um, which he's been with us for seven, eight years. It's a big miss for us, him leaving out the dressing room. That's Tom Carr. Um, so this year, yeah. Yeah. So this season's just a bit, it's a bit of an unknown. Um, I think at the moment we've had a bit of a whirlwind off the pitch um, where all our fans turned against the uh, representatives because they put the season tickets out and it sank like a lead balloon. So the last three, four days, Ridsdale's been doing his rounds on on the media. Uh, couple with that, we've got, I think it's another 11 players out of contracts in the summer. I think mid, mid-table, mid is probably the what my head tells me. My heart tells me we can probably do more because we have kept the players together. The only issue that I see is we've got a really, really tough start. Um, and then players like Ben Pearson, Ben Davies um, going out of contract, Daniel Johnson going out of contract. It's whether they'd want to stay if we have a tough start. And I, I think as a realist, you've got to kind of say mid-table, if, that happen, if the worst case scenario happens at the start, and they do decide to go, then we are probably going to be struggling because we still have players that we signed when we were in League One for 50 grand, 100 grand. And we've never really done that old old school Alex Ferguson rebuild. We've never done it. We've signed a few players along the way. But the problem is we don't have a reserve team. We don't have an under-23s to send some of these players to. So it's difficult to get them loans. And then it's the same with the youth team. It's difficult to get some of those loans. So... Is, is, the, is the manager the most important part of that at the moment, keeping him? Oh, yeah. Like, if we lost him, I, we, I think we'd fall apart at the moment. I've, he's the poor man's pep. That's what I say. He's the poor man's pep. Um, just the way that he's, he's, into, he's improved every single player that we've got. I mean, you looked at Jordan Hugel. Jordan Hugel was – nobody knew about him. And then he worked with him, and he just started banging in goals with someone. Callum Robinson moved him from being a left winger to more of a false nine shadow striker role, slightly off the left. And then again, he started banging in goals. The issue is we just don't seem to replace these players. And when you're replacing a 20, 25, 26 year old with a 31 year old Scott Sinclair, that's the direction that we like. Scott Sinclair's looked brilliant preseason, and he could be an answer to us from a goals perspective. But when you releasing somebody for seven, eight million and then bringing somebody in for free. Granted, wages are high for us. Yeah. It just doesn't breed confidence throughout the fan base. And then COVID hit and now we've got a lot of fans who've been fans for years that just don't want to renew the season tickets. And then I think Ridsdale said there's a 10 million gap in the finances at the moment that the owners plug in, which to be fair, we're one of the few teams that's paid all the salaries and I think the hope is we've paid them so players will renew contracts and that'll keep the fans happy but it just it just seems like every every day we're being linked with somebody and it's just agent speculation it's not actually there's no no grounds in it who would you sign which is a massive what, what, was, what would your two or three signings be if you could get players that you're linked with which ones do you want it's a tough one from a striker's perspective because we don't have the budget to go out and sign somebody that's proven. I mean, if it, if it was me, if people that were linked with Corley Woodrow, he's a bit of a yo-yo player, but he could add something. He's not afraid to take a shot, which I think that's something our strikers are a bit scared to do. It's more of a take it down, pass it on. You got um, Bar- Barnes here want like two, three million for him, aren't they? Exactly, yeah. And this is this is the challenge when you've got players like that. I think it's this fear of going out. We were trying to compete in this English market with, with this so-called English tax, and we just need to move away from it. I know I know it's a really tough thing to do, move away and go to some of these unknown leagues. But when you're talking, Corley Woodrow's a three million pound striker. No offense, he's not. In in a real world situation, if he was Spanish, he'd be a five hundred grand striker. And that, that's the challenge that we will always face. We, well, I think we've got the third lowest income, fourth possibly now Wickham have come into the league. We, Mark Eastan is, I just think at this point, not carrying the debt and you know being financially stable, as they keep saying, 
where's that coming from? Because Swansea have just signed um, Jamal Lowe, who apparently we'd be uh, agreed uh, terms with, according to Sky Sources. Um, and it just seems like everybody around us is getting ahead of the game. And we're just sitting there waiting for things to happen, waiting for things to fall into place. I know they said they've looked at about 40 players. Right. But you feel, you feel like you're credible. It's every year we're looking at 50. Yeah. Yeah. You f- if you feel like you're constantly... But saying that, every, every season where I've felt like this, we've had a good season. I think the important thing for us now is if we can't sign anyone, please, dear God, just keep those players together. Because the last season... Up until Christmas, I think we were top scorers in the league. We weren't beaten at home. I think we maybe beaten once or twice. That's something that with those players did. But the problem is, post-COVID, the fans turned. The te- you had teams like Luton playing a completely different game. Well, I think we had Luton the first game back, and nobody knew what Nathan Jones was going to do. <laughs> we, don't, we still don't understand why they sat their manager at the time, because they weren't exactly going badly. They were, they were doing... That 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th place, that's where Luton should have been. But then they brought in Nathan Jones. Everyone was looking a bit. But then you start getting teams like that playing in a completely different way. And I think we just got caught out by it. The players got caught out cold. They weren't ready for it. We, I think the biggest observation was we stopped pressing. We massively stopped pressing. I think we played Leeds away on Boxing Day. And we pressed them, pressed them, pressed them, pressed them, pressed them. And that was a trademark of our game up until Christmas. And then we got ahead and then we went, whoa, we need to change this. We need to just draw games instead of losing games. We, we always struggle against the bottom half teams. And I think this season, if we lose against some of the bottom half teams, because it's not as strong a league as it was last year, and it wasn't exactly a strong league last year, um, it's it, it, could be, it could be possibly even not far off a relegation season if it goes wrong. That's if it goes wrong. I, d- I hope it doesn't. But, yeah. Well, best of luck with the season, bud. Yeah. And, <laughs> and on the championship, Dara, you know, I had a couple of uh, questions. First of all, you know, do you think Sheffield Wednesday are going to overcome the points deduction or are we already talking one spot that's, one relegation spot that's taken? Oh, fuck no, do you know what I mean? Obviously, the Derby obviously got through with their whole stadium thing. They're fine. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's like, it should have been settled a long time ago. Shit like that shouldn't be dragging into a new season. So I, I really don't know, Phil. Um, mm-hmm. Your guess was mine. The championship's going to be interesting this season because, you know, you've got Derby County again. We, you know, we just spoke about them. They've just sold two of their best young players to Sheffield United. Um, you know, but that's probably to make sure they finance this season and, and get through them. Yeah. And that's the way it's going to be. A club the size of Derby, you know, a very wealthy owner. Um, you could argue, you know, our Derby County bigger than Sheffield United. Um, yeah, they're a big club, but that's football for you. It, it's like dog eat dog, and you end up eating each other, right? You know, one minute you're eating crumbs off someone's table, and then you're stealing crumbs off someone's table. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it's just, it's, yeah. Sorry, you've been you've been force fed crumbs, and then you're stealing crumbs. So it's just for me. I don't know. That's just the beauty of football, isn't it? How do you rate um, the promoted clubs' chances up in the championship? So what are we talking? Um... Wickham, Rotherham, Coventry? Um, two will be relegated. One will be very comfortable, in mm. my opinion. All right. So I guess that's, you know, when you think about Preston and you're talking about, you know, worrying about a, a relegation battle, that's kind Preston, of the hope, isn't it? Preston won't be in a relegation. Yeah. You know, you've already got a relegation. You've got Wednesday struggling. You've got two of the three coming up that are struggling. There's, I could name 10 worse teams than Preston. Yeah. So, and, and like I said before, their manager is the common denominator. Regardless of everything going on, if he stays there, there's no way I'd bet my arse on them not getting relegated. So they will be top half of the table. Uh, end of story. All right. Let's go to um, the Premier League. And thank you very much, Peter, for joining us. Thanks, um, bud. If we go, go to the Premier League, we have James. James is a Leeds United supporter. Congratulations, first of all. I say that through <laughs> gritted teeth on the promotion <laughs> last season. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Still celebrating. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what does the Premier League have to look forward to then from Leeds this season? Um, I think it, Leeds are a different club. So, I mean, the likes of West Brom and Fulham, they've been yo-yoing around the Premier League for 10, 15 years now. 
But Leeds haven't been touched by the uh, the Premier League money as yet. So in terms of the fan base, everything we're completely unsanitised. Where we're, we're the Leeds of old, basically. Um, I mm-hmm. think the Premier League know what it's getting. Um, and obviously, you've got Marcelo Bielsa at the helm. In Leeds, he is the second coming of Jesus Christ. He's uh, mm-hmm. he, he is unbelievable. Um, but I mean, the buzz around the city as well is just with the crap we've taken over the last ten, five, ten years. It's it's unbelievable. Still, it, it really is. I'll tell you right now, James. I I'm a Liverpool fan, and yep. I did not want to see Leeds as the first game up. Um, well, I can tell you, we didn't want to see Liverpool. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Seriously, I'm, I'm like. I'm apprehensive about that game because yeah. I'm, a, I'm a Bielsa fan. And I just, yeah. you know, my, my barber is like a massive Leeds fan. And I remember saying to him back in March or February before COVID, you're fine, you're up. And he's like, oh, no, we yeah. keep going with every year. I'm like, no, trust me. You know, that guy alone, I, I honestly think Leeds would be top 12 in the Premier League this year. I do. I certainly hope so. I certainly hope so. And, 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 and rightly so. Massive club. I've been saying it for years. The fan base and everything else. You're going to go into a golden period now. And, and fair play to the owner and, and Victor and everyone behind the scenes. And if they keep Yeltsin for a couple of years as a springboard with the academy backing it up with some good young players coming through, it's going to be exciting times, right? Yeah, uh, that's the big thing. The academy, we've kept our, our core beliefs, really. Um, you see teams that have gone like Fulham, who've spent 20, 30, 50 million. We've still got Calvin Phillips, obviously, who's just got an England call up, being here since the eight. Jamie Shackleton, he's right. now coming through with Jack Clark we sold to Tottenham for 10 million so yeah. the academy is it's getting a chance and it's still producing the likes of James Milner years back so we've kept the core beliefs and it's worked yeah look when you've got a coach like Bielsa you know what an education for younger players coming out of that academy uh, look he's hardcore and I'm sure he's one of their managers where he probably like rides a stallion for two three years and then he's got to get new stallions <laughs> it, was only yeah. so much. it was a bit like Jurgen Klopp early days with the whole press you know a German team that won titles but by year four they were nearly relegated because they'd been ridden so hard you can only do that in football for so long but yeah. I like I like Leeds' recruitment this summer I like some of the moves they're making they're obviously sprinkling some European recruitment in there big time and uh, I, I like the fact that he could probably take any player and make them a Premier League player within six months that's how good a coach he is yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, Ben White, obviously, we, we missed out on. It would have been a massive uh, a massive game for us, but 40 million for Ben White is a bit a bit much. Um, but yeah, that, when we bring players in, we used to wonder whether they'd turn out to be a hidden gem or just someone else that we'd throw out next season. But under Bielsa, we, everyone improves tenfold. We've got Stuart Dallas, who technically not the best footballer, but he, he works his bollocks off every game, and that's all we can ask for. Uh, Liam Cooper, we didn't think was crowd for League One. He's now a Premier League centre back. Um, yeah, he's working wonders. And Luke, Luke Eileen from Yeovil. I mean, look at him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seriously. Yeah, I mean, some of the goals he scored last season were unbelievable as well. Oh, uh, phenomenal. But yeah, I'm uh, very much looking forward to the uh, the Bielsa Klopp, Bielsa Guardiola, the Bielsa Lampard, especially. Um, and I think it's just a, a good name for the Premier League team. Should really you look at West Brom, Fulham? Do you get excited for those games? Probably I'll, not. I'll make a prediction for you. I bet you two things could happen. Leeds will have a phenomenal season. If yeah. Chelsea don't have a great season and say Lampard gets the tin tack, I bet you they go after Bielsa if he goes there and does a job on Chelsea. Because <laughs> can you imagine that? <laughs> I, I'm still celebrating promotion. I don't want to think about that. <laughs> so, so what's the deal with Bielsa? Is he signed a new contract? Is it kind of there but just getting it across um, the line? Yeah, we don't really know. I mean, the season starts on um, on Saturday, he's and he's sad. he was out of contract in June. So uh, I mean, I presume he's staying. He's still here, but mm. we don't really know. We think he signs. Fair play to your owner. He paid a lot of money for a championship yeah. manager of his quality yeah. to come in, and, and fair play, you get what you pay for, right? So yeah, it, uh, well, not always in football, but in this case, definitely. Yeah, I mean, you look at the the ones before that, Heckingbottom. I think he tried to. Uh, a cheaper route, hoping it'd be a hidden mm-hmm. gem. Um, Christiansen, same again. Um, yeah, fair play. Put his bars online and it's worked. Worked. No, it's good. I enjoyed the documentary they did on, uh, was it Netflix? It was on as well. Uh, Amazon. And there's, a, there's a new one coming out, actually. They've, they've just uh, released the uh, trailer thing for the new one. So that'll be out in a couple of weeks, I'd imagine. Oh, brilliant. Awesome. Yeah. Well, 
Have a great season. Enjoy it, all right? You Leeds fans deserve it. See you, mate. Go on. Uh, Paul, all the best. <laughs> Well, thanks a lot um, for joining us and uh, thank you to everybody for joining us on this special fans forum. It's the, the first time we've really done something to bring across fans from a variety of different clubs. And I know that, uh, Dara, we're going to try and do uh, more things like this as we go through the season. It's definitely important to us to try and awesome. you know, have some that different awesome. opinions. Guys, thank you very much for tuning in. That was brilliant. For anyone listening out there, we want more fans tuning in. We're going to have a segment on owners who aren't popular. So any fans out there who've got problems with their owners, no, we, we, know, we already know, pal, all right? You wait a minute. <laughs> but anyone who's got real issues with owners, I'm a football club owner, so you can pick my brains. Maybe I can give you a different slant on it. Um, maybe some of the owners you give grief to aren't as bad as you think. Um, so let's try and pick four or five fans of ownership clubs to have issues with their owners next week mm. um, and, and have a good chat through that. But listen, for the rest of you, thank you very much for tuning in, guys. Much appreciate your time tonight. Yeah, and, and, and thank you, everybody, for listening into the pod. We, um, just to let you know, we actually launched a website this week to accompany the podcast. So if you want to check that out, that's going to have all the previous episodes on. That's at hardtruthfootball.com. And also an easier way for you to submit a question to us or get in touch. There's just a contact form right on that website. So that's hardtruthfootball.com slash contact. So I think I wish everybody here... All the best wishes for the start of the season, uh, perhaps with the exception of Colchester. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I, I say that with a smile, but no, I hope everyone does really well this season. You know, that we've got football back, I think, is something that's just exciting for all of us. So Dara right. and I are going to be back next Wednesday. And until then, stay safe. Thanks, guys.